Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Let us now welcome the first keynote panel discussion to start our morning on this My Digital Workforce Week. Moderating this session is Dr. Sumita Nai, the Vice President of Digital Skills and Jobs, Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation, MDEC. Dr. Sumita leads MDEC's digital talent development and inclusion initiatives. To date, her work has impacted more than 2 million Malaysians via digital skills and income opportunities. She also serves as an adjunct faculty at the Monash University School of Business and Economics. Over to you, Dr. Sumitra. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Entry, for uh, the kind introduction. A very good morning uh, to all of you and welcome back to week three of uh, Malaysia Tech Month. And um, this week is going to be all about digital skills. And in fact, we have a bonus, so we're extending it by another week. Uh, where we will continue to bring to you free training uh, as well as thousands of uh, digital uh, tech and services related jobs. Now, uh, this morning, uh, I'm really, really uh, excited about the panel that we have uh, here today for you. And the reason for this is because, you know, as we know, digital jobs are on the rise. Over the last one year, um, you know, MDEC has been tracking the number of digital vacancies that are out there. And we've seen the number of vacancies, you know, increasing by close to four times, right? Three and a half times uh, across various uh, top job platforms and portals in the country. And these jobs are mainly in e-commerce, cybersecurity, networking, creative content, and design. At the same time, we also know that all jobs, regardless of which industry or function, are becoming increasingly digital in the sense that there is some level of digital skills that are needed for whatever job that you're doing. And, you know, alongside this, we also see that, you know, the government has allocated funding worth millions, right? I think it's more than a billion via various agencies, including the likes of uh, Human Resource Development Corporation, Perqueso, uh, Talent Corp, uh, MOSTI, Ministry of Higher Education, and even MDEC uh, for reskilling and upskilling. At the same time, many people, uh, we also know, um, even in our, our midst, uh, continue to unable to find uh, jobs, right? And at the same time, we also hear employers saying that, you know, their own employees don't have uh, the right kind of digital skill sets to support their digital transformation. So what really is happening? And that's what, you know, our panel today is hoping to shed greater light on and to look at what we can possibly do together from across government, uh, private sector and public sector to narrow this digital talent gap amongst the existing workforce, as well as job seekers who are out there? And how can we then help to improve one, uh, improve one's chances of not just securing a job, but thriving in one? And to discuss this topic uh, and to provide their expert, and, and I'd like to say also practical insights, uh, we have a lineup of seasoned and diverse industry players from across I would like to say from across the country, because we have two panelists uh, today who are all the way from Sarawak. And, you know, in a physical uh, in a physical world, it would have been very challenging to get two of them to be here. Of course, Nicholas is based here, uh, but, you know, really great to have Dr. Carol as well, uh, you know, with us. And so on the panel today, we have Nicholas Sagal, who is the president of the Malaysia uh, Digital Association. Dr. Kairul Hafiz, who is the Head of uh, Research and Product Development at Sarawak Digital Economy Corporation. Uh, Mr. Anthony Raja, who is the Managing Director for Executive Search at Conferry Malaysia. Uh, and also uh, Shinzi, who is the Recruitment Marketing Manager at Intel Malaysia. So it's a really, really diverse panel that we have today. And uh, without you know, further ado, I'd like to kick off uh, you know, with uh, the questions that we have for the panel. Uh, and I'm sure that you know, in the audience, if you do, I'm sure you all have many, many questions for these experts and feel free uh, to send them in as we go through the panel today. And so to kick it off, I'd like to put this up to Anthony, right? The first question to Anthony. So Anthony, as the MD for Executive Search at Corn Ferry, can you give us a general overview of digital tech career opportunities and trends uh, that's you know, happening today in the country? 
Thank you, Dr. Sumitra, and glad to be with the panelists today on the uh, My Digital Workforce Week session, keynote panel. Um, if the slides can come up. Uh, so what I did was, uh, Sumitra, as I looked at a couple of things and uh, put together a few slides for you uh, so that it can help uh, 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 reach our attendees uh, in terms of what's trending. So uh, let me just share with you what is the uh, what is digital, right? and uh, just set the stage from a global trend perspective and a how do we relate it back to a successful talent, digital talent perspective. So, uh, so let's start with what is digital, just to kind of calibrate all of us. It's changing, the trends are changing in reimagining how talent will fit into a, a digital talent environment, uh, the different ways of working uh, and the types of the way to work and also the need for people working differently, right? So if you look at that, some of the uh, studies that from Conferry perspective that I would like to highlight is, um, as it's changing, it's also looking at a more diverse workforce, the speed at which we implement, the growth at which at the pace, uh, extremely fast pace that we are running. And along with it, not just the Malaysia market, but also the global markets are evolving uh, especially in the last 14 to 15 months, it's accelerated. Now, along with it, if I were to revert uh, and look at what's the capabilities required to stay successful, it's growth mindset, number one, managing ambiguity uh, in a complex environment. We're also talking about enabling diversity in the workforce. And, uh, and of course, uh, how do we adapt to these changes? And it's about agility, right? So the growth, complexity management or ambiguity management, adaptation and agility becomes part of what is a uh, capability requirement for digital talent today. Now, along with it, if you see from an organization perspective, we are talking about innovation. That means the way to connect to people is changing. The pace at which we are connecting, I think we are all at home right now. We are connecting like almost 24 by seven. We don't know when do we start, stop working, start, you know, and, and, and these are, normal ways of looking at how we are adapting to those changes. And, and that's when an organization looks at how do we empower the talent. And these are from a global perspective, what trends that we are seeing. Now, if you were to move forward, um, and I want to break it down to all of you so that you can look at what's the mindset that we are looking into from a digital era perspective, from a competency perspective, traits and driver perspective, but at the same time experience that's relevant for the digital, you know, uh, in, in the, the changes that's happening during this period of time. This understanding is important so that you can learn from this and look at what areas that you are, uh, what organizations are looking for as a talent, as a job seeker, and what organizations are looking for as a talent seeker, right? So, the, of course, we do have the general trends, right, of uh, deeper customer or centricity, uh, challenges in terms of predictability, uh, cross-functional uh, training across. and But if you were to break it down into a chart perspective, you're, you're talking about uh, four areas and one is business as usual talent, right? That's in a current mindset where everything is status quo. Uh, and then moving across into a catalyst or change where organizations are going through change, what type of talent they are looking for, the mindset of addressing tactical business needs, as well as Keeping, mind, keeping in mind for the digital journey. And on the other hand, if you're talking about uh, a talent who's on the journey, right, to have a structured approach of development, like what you heard from Dr. Sumitra and earlier from Ponsarina about the, the investments that's taking place into opportunities for development of talent, but also making sure that you balance that as an organization. And finally, of course, how do we look at tomorrow's talent today? Uh, what are those strategic innovation that companies are looking for and ensuring that they are having good succession in terms of candidates coming in at all levels. And we'll go through that in a few minutes. All right, so some of the findings and I wanted to share with you from a global perspective, but connected to the Malaysia perspective as well, right? So uh, from the study, we looked at about 12 domains. And in these domains, we talked about enterprise architecture, software development, cybersecurity, data science, digital business, uh, of course, business process, uh, e-commerce, web content, and so on. So blockchain as well. So I'm hoping I didn't miss anybody there out there. All of you uh, from a job seeker perspective, as well as company perspective, how this diverse universe 
of uh, uh, talent pool was kept in mind to attract, retain, and reward talent, yeah, as we go through. So from that study, we have looked at a couple of areas, and for today's purpose, I'll just focus on a couple of areas. One is from an entry-level talent, if you're starting off, uh, from an age profile group, seniority, what type of prevailing roles are there out there for you to think of? And if you're already in it, how do you pr prioritize these as part of your uh, uh, career uh, career passion, right? So you're talking about cybersecurity analyst levels, yeah? Social media, quality assurance, digital marketing and project. And these are on high demand basis as you enter into the talent and not forgetting digital GBS as well as part of this. It's a high demand area. So if you're looking at upskilling yourself, uh, this is an area that you need to consider and of course stay in in course as part of your development now if you look at the of course this is the entry point and of course you look at the management top management level uh, and age profiling is about 40 years and above uh, and the type of roles that is out there uh, that is in demand are chief information digital cyber security head of digital marketing head of app application development and program management. These are some of those examples. And of course, this kind of varies between organizations, but these are generic positions that I wanted to highlight as part of the top management requirements. Of course, 10 years and above experience group. The third is a very interesting infused or hybrid group that you are looking into. So this is a kind of combination that's happening out there uh, uh, where you are an architect or a specialist uh, uh, as part of the role. So the first one, when I talked about it's more like an analyst as you enter. The, the top management is more of a, uh, a chief or a head uh, or a lead role. And an infused role, I think you're a more of an architect, specialist and developer. It's more of, for example, uh, financial and technology, FinTech, healthcare and technology, health tech, and insurance and technology, insure tech, and so on and so forth, right? So all of these are, and of course, earlier you heard about robotic process automation for the GBS industry. So wherever you're able to infuse, the digital talent role becomes evolved. So from a perspective, this is what the market is looking at. And as a job seeker, what do you need to look at? So balancing between uh, a job seeker and a talent seeker, how do you build this uh, portfolio, I would say, as part of your career? The next, I think this is a final slide. I just wanted to give you a perspective. Attracting digital talent um, where are the sources from a data point, right? The top three sources for digital talent in Malaysia continue to lead from LinkedIn, uh, recruitment websites, and employee referrals. It's interesting to note that while LinkedIn is leading on the professional track, be, your, be on LinkedIn. So to make sure you are promoting yourself and creating a presence, this applies to both employers and employees. But from a recruitment and an employee referral, you see the number, it's almost competing with each other. So being part of a network and Creating a networking relationship with people helps you make sure that you are referred as an opportunity. Uh, when there is an opportunity that comes up, you can be considered and they can introduce you. And that's equally powerful in terms of applying for a role as compared to networking. Now, in terms of uh, considering candidates from other countries, just to, for an indicative perspective, that's 43% say yes, if for the jobs that they want to con uh, consider when it's very scarce to find the talent. Uh, overview generally in terms of searching for digital talent, uh, majority of the respondents have indicated that there is a significant scarcity in digital talent, which means all of you are in the right uh, career track and you need to look at continuing to build your, uh, yourself uh, as uh, technology outdates itself very fast. So the top three digital tech or uh, digital talent roles that's available in Malaysia from a prevalence perspective is cybersecurity digital marketing, uh, and of course, a business process of, uh, or BPO, or GBS roles, right? So if you look at all of these, uh, this is just an indicative. It's not a complete list, but it gives you the prioritization of what you can consider and how you can make sure that you're able to seek uh, the right opportunities and as well as making sure that employers are looking at the right uh, talent pool to be able to bridge this. Um, and uh, uh, th th that's a quick summary. I just wanted to give you a perspective, a visual perspective as you uh, consider uh, your growth in, your, in the digital uh, uh, career. Thank you. And back to... Um, Thank you. Dr. Thank Sumita. you, Anthony. Thank yeah. you. I think that was really, really useful for us to set the context. And I'm, I'm glad that, you know, many of the things that you, you mentioned will also be sort of touched on or featured over the next few days. So in fact, 
Uh, I think right after the session, you know, you mentioned digital marketing is one of the top, uh, you know, yep. most in demand jobs. And there's going to be a session looking at the Let's Learn Digital this year, where we're offering free digital marketing courses. And then later this afternoon, you mentioned LinkedIn as one of the top uh, recruitment platforms. And we have uh, a speaker from LinkedIn this afternoon who's going to be talking about how do you strengthen your profile on LinkedIn yeah, from a, a recruitment uh, standpoint. So, so thank you for that, for putting the context. Um, and also, obviously, you know, what you shared was that there's opportunities across, right? Whether you are a hardcore tech or whether you are not really a tech person, there could be what you call infused or hybrid roles. Uh, and so with all these opportunities that are abound, and then, you know, at the same time, I'm sure we have people on the call who are still trying to figure out why is it they're not getting a job? And so the question to, you know, I'd like to pose to uh, perhaps Shinzi and Nicholas, I'd like to hear your views. What are the challenges that are being faced by companies in getting these, you know, vacancies filled? Anthony alluded to the fact that 85% of the respondents said there is scarcity uh, you know, in candidate scarcity. So what are the challenges that are being faced by companies? Perhaps Shinzi, if you can go first and then Nicholas. Hey, thanks, uh, Dr. Sumitra. So to concur with what Anthony has just mentioned, half an hour before I joined this panel discussion, I did a quick check. There are over 400 jobs available for Intel Malaysia at jobstepintel.com. And definitely I can feel the same sentiment that is being brought out by Anthony that there's a talent scarcity in, in this particular market. I will probably boil down into two major factors. One is on top of the relevant skill sets, right? So for example, in Intel, we are very focused on engineering and all those skill sets, um, majority of our vacancies are looking for experienced talent. And those um, silicon design and verification skill sets are going to be nurtured as soon you know, as they graduate from universities and accumulate all their experience through various projects. And it's very tough to find such relevant talent because um, on my personal analysis would be like the A team that is graduated from the engineering uh, faculty across universities, of course, they would love to have a job as an engineer, but many of them are being also driven to work in you know, different industries such as fintech, e-commerce. Um, so, there's definitely a talent scarcity where some of our A team members graduates, they are really good at engineering. They move and prosper in other different fields uh, that we are not able to look for specific, uh, you know, silicon design and verification talent in that perspective. The second will be a uh, good news, especially for a country that's a competition among different, you know, competitors. Uh, we have more companies uh, setting up their uh, footprint in our country that is vying for talent. Semiconductor is an industry that is thriving, uh, fortunately, in, in the era of the pandemic. You keep hearing about chip shortage news around the world uh, where people are hiring in mass for semiconductor industry. So that competition is heating up. And a lot of people, sometimes they will ask me, hey, Shinzi, you're Intel. Definitely people would love to join you, right? Uh, but people have to bear in mind that, you know, there are competition from even overseas, like what Anthony has mentioned, and they are preparing huge communication package to attract the talent from our country to work in their country. So the competition is so intense that we are facing in, in various parts of the world. So I'll probably boil it down in two major factors uh, for, for that talent scarcity environment that we're facing right now. Thank you. Thank you, Shinzi. And you know, uh, while I guess Intel is sort of a more conventional tech company, and I think you've just highlighted what some of the challenge, challenges are in relation to the talent war. I want to say it's a talent war that's out there, right? Because, it, you know, trying to find the, the greatest and the best talents. And so you have the conventional kind of tech companies like Intel. But then I guess that's where Nicholas, you know, comes in because Nicholas is from, you know, the kinds of companies you mentioned are the ones that are in his ecosystem, right? The e-commerce, the fintech, the digital, the creative. And so Nick, what are you seeing from your end? What are the challenges that, you know, companies are facing? Talent. Yeah, so, so from an uh, MVA point of view, we represent about 66 uh, digital companies at the moment. So I think uh, I can boil them into to a few categories, right? Uh, it, I definitely agree with the last point where, you know, competing with the uh, regional uh, companies is one of the biggest challenges we have. Uh, you know, you know, re really, re and especially during this uh, pandemic time, a lot of these talent are, you know, high in demand. And we always find the top-notch talent 
gets to go into a regional uh, role, right? Into a probably a company not based in, in Malaysia, and they, they, they can work in remotely, right? So there was well, there's one definitely it's there. Let's let's keep it there. Uh, but one of the things that we we keep on you know uh, uh, seeing in in companies that you know that we represent is that there's a lack of you know uh, you know there, there's not a lot of I mean there's there's, there's enough talent in technology, right? Data, uh, the know-how, you know, they, they get into the, into the companies, but I think one of the biggest challenges we find is the lack of uh, connect, connectiv connectivity to the business need, right? So that means, you know, they are not as, you know, when they go into the job, uh, you know, a lot of the companies that we represent, they are agencies, they are tech company, they are, you know, they, they are already expected to run as, 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 as you join that, right? So we have challenge with a lack of, you know, uh, collaboration, uh, business understanding, and especially from the from the tech background kind of kind of uh, kind of kind of role, because you know a lot of these companies that we represent, they are you are, we are expecting them to to do both things, right? Not just uh, uh, you know design data in the background or design a website. We are, we need to make sure that they understand the business. So I think that's one of the uh, probably one of the biggest challenges we've seen. Uh, I think apart from you know some of the things that we talked about, and I think. I think we probably need to look at you know how to you know address that, and hence a lot of the companies that we represent as well don't hire because every time they go into the interview they find great background you know you know graduated from great university but when they try out uh, in, in, in them out in terms of you know the business connectivity and understanding how uh, you know even the entire ecosystem of digital for example like you know the data system right they, they wouldn't understand they don't understand it enough so you know a lot of us uh, decide so you know let's just wait for the for the next challenge in the end uh, we, we end up not hiring anyone so i think that's one of the biggest challenge uh, you know uh, that we are facing just one yeah thanks thanks anthony so you know it sounds like um, employers are, are expecting or at least hoping for more work ready talents like talents who are ready to get to work like kids the ground running you know from day one and yeah i mean i guess that is tough to do and so for talents that are in the call uh you know it's a it's important to think about how you're going to pick up those work re really talent uh, skills you know and experiences so even if you're a fresh graduate uh you know how are you going to pick that up because that's what you're looking for and chinzi mentioned as well you're looking for experienced talent so and that's i think a common thread that we're finding across right but you know like to just maybe switch a little bit and sort of look at whether you know we're facing the similar situation uh, in East Malaysia and so we have Dr. Cairo here from uh, SDEC, yeah, Sarawak Digital Economy Corporation, our twin, MDEX twin in Sarawak. Uh, so, so you know what are you seeing on the ground as far as the talent, uh, you know, digital talent market in, in Sarawak and maybe even East Malaysia? What is, what is it like there? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So I think I agree with uh, the panelists before me that, you know, uh, if you talk about digital tech jobs today, the, the, the job scope has been expanded a lot. And if you look at the ICT highways in Sarawak in 2019, there are about only 11,000 uh, more or less right, people working in the ICT industry. It's just about 0.9% of the employed person uh, within the workforce itself. So it's fairly small market compared to uh, 1.3 million employed workforce in Sarawak. So uh, it, it also comes back to your point where uh, previously most of these people working in the ICT industries, they are more uh, in the conventional tech uh, companies where they do the software development system situation and the likes, right? Uh, but I think in terms of uh, uh, the implementation of the digital economy initiative and, and you know, accelerated by the COVID-19 pandemic in a big way. Uh, we're starting to see that more and more non-tech or non-digitalized industries adopting digital platform in their businesses. And I think that will translate to more digital tech jobs uh, being created. Right? So, for example, Shawa is targeting uh, to have more than uh, 60,000 SMEs uh, to be developed by 2030, and they are also targeting 70% of them are expecting to adopt a digital platform. So if you, it's about roughly about 42,000 SME that will need digital talent as the new hires, right? And there's a, a study uh, by shawajobs.com for the East Malaysia company. Uh, so they found out that uh, despite the COVID-19 situation, 30% of the companies strategically plan to shift to another market by digitalizing their businesses. So this will also open up uh, some of the potential uh, job creation to talk, uh, for the digital tech jobs, right? And I think looking at uh, looking towards the 2030, so is uh, targeting to create 
190 new jobs uh, uh, for a post-COVID uh, strategy, yeah, in their, in their post-COVID-19 strategy. So, and they're also targeting uh, around 80% of them going to be trained in digital skills. So that's about 150 jobs that require digital skills uh, to sustain the digital transformation in the organization. So I guess uh, that's the overview that I can give in terms of the, the job market thing, you know, that requires digital skills uh, in Sarawak. Now. Thank you, Dr. Cairo. You just now, just a clarification. You mentioned 190 jobs or 190,000 jobs? Yeah, sorry, 190,000 jobs. Okay, yeah. all right. That makes, that yeah. makes more sense. 190,000 yeah. jobs by 2030. And out of that, you said how many percent digital? 80%, is it? 80%, yeah. 80% digital. Okay, so so yeah, that's yeah. great. So which means that, uh, you know, Sarawak is also looking at uh, you know, going aggressively into its digital transformation. I know there is a huge digital Sarawak plan. And so, uh, you know, for those of you who are from East Malaysia, there's lots of opportunities uh, back home. So do, do start looking at that as well. And, you know, reach out to Cairo if, if, you're, if you're wondering where those opportunities are. Now, I have a, before we go into the next round of questions, I have a question here for Anthony from our audience. So I'm just going to, I'm going to uh, raise that now. Yeah, Anthony? Anthony, sure. um, question is, is scarcity due to unavailability of talent uh, who are simply not there? Or is it due to a lack of skill? Or are there other issues like unreasonable salary expectation or other reasons? I think, uh, thanks, uh, Sumitra. And thanks to the person who put up the question. Uh, partially, the answer is there in the question itself. So uh, I think you earlier you had asked the right question to Sinzi and Nicholas, and they gave a perspective around it. So let me add uh, to that perspective, right? So uh, scarcity here is, uh, as technology evolves, the demand for talent, quality of talent uh, is increasing uh, in order to be more competitive, right? So uh, experienced talent makes a big impact. And experienced talent comes along, if you notice in the, my first uh, uh, pointers I highlighted about the kind of mindset that the individual should have. So that addresses the attitude and the expectation. And expectation here is compensation as well. Yeah. So expectation to be successful in a role, expectation to be reasonable in the compensation. That plays an important part. And of course, the most important thing is being competitive to be able to contribute your capability. And we see a lot of people might have paper qualifications, might have had certifications, but uh, the lack of that, um, if I may say, spirit of making sure that you're able to uh, achieve the goals, uh, go through a competitive environment in an interview. I'm sure Intel, as uh, Senzi will be able to say, it's not easy to get through the interview process with Intel, right? So, and and of course, Nicholas, to get into a top-notch, uh, uh, top uh, social media organization, or like Facebook, for example, uh, and if they are setting up in Malaysia, it's going to be a, a tough role to get through. So they have to be competitive. Yeah. Number three is, um, I can't stress this more than enough. It's about the attitude. Uh, an attitude of being able to uh, work in an environment, learn in an environment and contribute. And that's where a lot of choices are being made incorrectly uh, by individuals. Not to grab an opportunity or anything, but to at least consider an opportunity fairly and to be able to be competitive in that environment. So scarcity here is a collective view. It's not limited to one area, but it's limited to two to three areas. And it, it's based on competitiveness, how competitive they are in the interview process, uh, how reasonable are they in the expectation? And of course, the right attitude that they have to uh, go through the uh, entire process of being successful in the role. Thanks, Anthony. You know, it's interesting you mentioned that uh, it's the experienced talent that people are looking for, which kind of brings me to my next question for Shinzi and Nicholas, you know, even uh, the, the research that we've been doing in NBEC shows us that 70% of the vacancies that are out there for digital uh, related jobs are for experienced candidates, right? Now, um, you know, other than full-time employment, which is looks like it's mainly for experienced talent. How else can fresh graduates gain work experience? Any ideas or what you've seen as, you know, things that have attracted your attention as best practices? Uh, so, so we've seen, uh, you know, be because, you know, going back to my first comment, because we can't find full-time uh, talent, 
a lot of these companies that uh, that we represent, uh, and even ourselves, you know, I work for uh, you know Media Prima Red Media Group. We're actually going out into you know platform where we can hire people by project, uh, right? A specific you know uh, a gig that you can do for X amount of time. Uh, you know, uh, you know, you deliver it, and that's pretty much it, right? But we find you know when we do that, I think uh, talent when talent tends to do that, they, they maybe can pick up a lot of this business, uh, you know, collaboration or, you know, even the entrepreneurial spirit of, you know, the companies that they work for. Uh, and, and, I, and I agree with, uh, totally with Anthony, uh, you know, it's really an attitude of expectation from the talent, right? Uh, a lot of talent coming up into the market, uh, expecting, you know, uh, jumping into a high uh, paying job or, or a good company, right? But sometimes a lot of the things you got to learn from from scratch and especially in, in, even if you have a high, uh, you know, qualification, you got to really learn that, you know, the, to be, you know, uh, expect, you know, uh, that you will be starting from, from, from scratch, right? I think so certainly that's what we uh, advise is from, you know, from fresh talent. Uh, it's not that we don't want to hire, it's just a matter of like, you know, we want to see whether you have the experience, uh, you know, at least some experience when you go into an actual full-time uh, interview. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Nick. What about you, Shinzi? From your yeah. perspective, what can what can fresh graduates do? Yeah. If if you didn't manage to get any internship program before you graduate, unfortunately, but no worries. I I kind of agree with Nick in the sense of the gig economy, right? That's the buzzword nowadays where people are getting platforms online. I can show that you, you just go and do a Google search. There are platforms free for you to post yourself up on the jobs that you do. I think one of the common things that I, I kind of um, you know identify with fresh graduates nowadays is that they will tell me that they have attended tens of thousands of courses, uh, but they have never applied it. So what I would recommend to, to the fresh graduate is that if you are doing, for example, social media marketing, which I think in the area that uh, fresh graduates are, sometimes outperforming experienced uh, candidate, right? Because uh, of the, the, the infancy of these platforms. Show us, right? For example, how do you market yourself in this platform? Uh, apply the skills that you have learned from all these webinars and courses that you have joined. And if you are going back to the traditional software programming career, be active in platform like GitHub, you know, Stack Overflow. Recruitment, you know, um, platform has evolved more than just LinkedIn and, and the recruitment website. People are going into all these, you know, uh, specialized software development uh, hub to look for the right talent. So I guess these are the things that, you know, you can contribute a line of code here and there and people will get you, you know, notice about your contribution there. I'm sure that you know, this is a way for you to, to market yourself and gain some experience of working on a project. Thank you. So, you know, if I can just sum up, I think definitely gig is one, uh, gig jobs, taking on gig jobs are, are a way of picking up experience without going straight into a full-time job. So if you're unable to get a full-time job, you've picked up some skills, you can practice via these platforms. And uh, MDEC has a a program called uh, Global Learning uh, Online Workforce, where we train people, how do you actually boost your chances of getting jobs on these platforms? So that kind of also builds uh, confidence and builds your other soft skills on how you can actually start to secure jobs. And we've actually seen a lot of people transition from gig work into full-time work. So one of the speakers that we have this week is gonna be talking about how she started off as a gig worker uh, via the you know, the, the training she came for, but today she is a full-time remote worker for Google uh, in Silicon Valley, but she's based in uh, Malaysia. I think she's from Malacca or something like that, right? So, so that's a, one area. And then I think you also mentioned other skill sets, mindsets, and Anthony spoke about that as well. And um, uh, in the afternoons throughout this week, we're going to be having uh, various uh, sessions on soft skills, on various other, you know, mindset, growth mindset, lifelong learning. And I would urge you to just, you know, the audience to just join us for those sessions as well, because increasingly it's becoming important that it's not just the tech skills, but it's a package. It's the other capabilities, the mindset, the attitude that Anthony uh, spoke about uh, as well. And of course, you know, showing the application the, the, that you, you know, not just learning the skill, but how you've applied it. So projects, portfolios, all those things are important. And in today's world, you have so many different social media platforms and how you can actually show uh, your work as well. So, you know, I think that's, that's just to summarize uh, some of the points that were raised. We do have some questions from the audience. Hang on. Uh, does any of the skills, okay, so first question, does any of the skills or talent program contribute to finding the right talent? 
Okay, so I think this is from probably from an employer. Does any of the skills or talent pro programs contribute to finding the right talents? Anyone would like to take it? Um, I guess, yeah, I guess the question is, you know, all these training programs, does it also lead to helping employers to find talents? Okay, um, so uh, let me try on this. Uh, so we have to put our head on as an employer, right? And uh, look at it from that perspective. So um, there's two ways to do. I think it's about a handshake that needs to happen, right? Uh, and or last mile connectivity uh, for telcos, they say generally. So uh, you got a balance between the handshake and the last mile connectivity. So which means an individual is being upskilled by way of this uh, effort. And there's also an employer opportunity is also given in the platform with MDAC, right? So employers can come in. And I think that was the third point which uh, Pon Sumitra, uh, the Pon uh, Surina was uh, indicating, it's matching the talent. So I believe there's no uh, learning process for that. I think it's based on what organizations are looking for. Uh, like in the case of Intel, you're, you have a set, like 400 vacancies, you're, you need to have prioritized, it depends on how you're hiring, right? And likewise, if you match it back to all the 5,000 vacancies that you have published is from employers, right? Right. So they have a perspective of what they need and what they want. And it's not the same for everyone, right? Not same for all the organizations. So for organizations, I think they are looking for a set of skill, a mindset and skill set. So we've got to marry that mindset and skill set. And that's what MDEC is doing to develop the talent, right? For, but for organizations, I think it's also, maybe I should put something a bit controversial out here. Uh, it's also for them to give an opportunity for someone who's got less experience. Take that chance. Uh, and I've been in the industry for 20 over years, recruited hundreds and thousands of people. And I must tell you that there is chance also plays an important role, but it doesn't come for everybody. But I think it's fair to consider someone and as part of a chance to get them start rolling with you. So that's one suggestion I would do. Secondly, is of course, uh, I'm, I'm saying you're not going to hire anyone. It's just making sure that they have the mindset and the skill set, but you, you don't know whether there's a gap in experience or others, but you want to take that chance. That's what I'm recommending. Number two is if there is an opportunity to upskill them during this program uh, where they might have need six months to 12 months to 24 months, allow that opportunity to come in because you're investing in that person. So the person, the job seeker is also investing in you. So that's the second suggestion and advice I would give. And number three is, I know you are under pressure as an employer because your line manager is saying, please hire this now. And then you're going and saying, oh no, this person has got only uh, like a fresh graduate at a, or one year experience is not enough. So sometimes it's also about your push to the respective hiring manager and say, the line manager and say, give it a shot. This person has got talent, right? And then you build it around it. So these are all, and I know it, it sounds like very philosophical and mindset perspective, but there is a deep study around this that allows you to indicate that you are, it's like almost like co-piloting the talent for you. Internship is the best way to do it, but unfortunately, if you do not have it, bridge it with a management program and then allow them to move in. Otherwise, fresh graduates will be out there. I think, Sumitra, more than 800,000 people out there unemployed. Yeah, uh, yeah, the even if, are, yeah, yeah, even yeah. If, if the group of people consider a 10% or 20% of uh, thing and if they start gig and then come in allow them to explore that don't yeah. say gig work means uncertain work gig work is an opportunity where the individual tried it so i'm only answering from an employer perspective to all the employers out there to see how you can look at it from that perspective but i think uh, dr sumitra this is a good suggestion to do a briefing for employers to help them know how to hire where to hire what type of you know processes yeah. that can help improve their their hiring as well Back to you. That's that's great. Thanks, thanks, Anthony. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, you know, and it's true. Like even uh, the MyWit initiative that Serena mentioned, there is an element of uh, talent matching. In fact, there's a job expo that's happening uh, right this two weeks. Lots of jobs are up there, and uh, for many of those jobs, if the people don't have the skills, then there are skilling programs. So we're trying to like reverse it now and looking at what the market needs, and then you know, get them hired and then equip them with the skills. So hopefully that helps. Dr. Carol, what are you seeing in Sarawak? Is that like, are you also looking at that, you know, like the training programs that are being rolled out in Sarawak? Are you also looking at the talent matching component? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> I mean, just 
uh, like Anthony said, you know, looking at the employee perspective, there's another component that I think uh, pretty much very important is that when the employee, uh, the employer decides to have a talent or uh, a tech job being, uh, you know, uh, located in the organization, they should also to understand uh, this or take some responsibilities that you know, to understand uh, what uh, those jobs going to do and how it can uh, improve their businesses and so on. Because we did uh, in the state itself, we do have the initiative to uh, gauge the demand from the industries, right? We ask, okay, what kind of talents do you need in terms of digital uh, skills, right? And they did provide the input. But once we said, that, okay, we have this talent ready for you, and they said that, oh, we, we, we don't need it right now. We didn't need it, you know, in the next five years. So they don't actually know, uh, they know that they're going to need it someday, but they didn't actually know that, you know, they need it today. So I think uh, that's part of the, the, the thing that when we try to do the talent matching, we, we conduct all the training programs, right? And just to, to meet the industry demand. But apparently those inputs are not really taken into account seriously, right? So I think in terms of the employee perspective, uh, to understand uh, further what your organization needs uh, in terms of the new talents, and, uh, skills and digital skills needed is very much important as well. Thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Carol. Yeah, so, so certainly we need to look at, you know, both the talent supply and demand component issue, right? Uh, now there's a there's many many questions that have come through and we're running out of time but you know there's one question that I'd like to address which is and the question is to me why are we still seeing a higher outflow of digital talents any insight on the root cause are we losing our competitiveness I think this is a, a very key question right uh, to me you know, this talent war is not a national talent war it's a global talent war right uh, every every country that you go to. I think there are similar conversations in that there is not enough of these digitally skilled talents. There's not enough people who can do these kinds of emerging tech because the rate at which tech is evolving is also fast, number one. Number two, I wouldn't really say we're losing uh, the competitiveness part because um, you know there have been, like I think there was a McKinsey uh, study or is it Randstad a few years ago where about 90% of youth, Malaysian youth, fresh talents, are looking at global exposure. You know, people want global exposure and there's nothing wrong with that. And we need to realize that the world is becoming increasingly uh, a very global marketplace, especially today with COVID. Uh, you know, we're already hearing about remote working groups, right? On permanent basis located in different parts of the world. And so we must realize that things are opening up and the whole structure of how work is being done and where is also changing. That mindset is also changing. And I think the, the role, you know, every organization has a role in making sure that, uh, and I guess this goes for employers mainly, is that they're doing their best to ensure that they are providing an attractive uh, environment, not just to attract talents, but to retain and grow these talents as well. So some of the questions that were answered, I think, relate to that. Uh, you know, there needs to be a career development path. There needs to be continuous reskilling and upskilling. All those things are important for us to ensure that we attract and retain the best talents, regardless of where they, they are from, right? Because it's, it is becoming a global talent marketplace. Now, the last question I'd like to pose to all of you uh, is that what is your company doing uh, or organization doing to help make career professionals? You know, we hear a lot of people who also are between jobs now, who have lost their jobs, what are your organizations doing to help them uh, to secure jobs either in your organization or within the ecosystem? Who would like to go first? Maybe we can start with uh, Shinzi. Sure, yeah. So uh, for mid-career professionals, we are doing a few initiatives in this perspective. Uh, one will be, um, if you if you have um, following, uh, been following Intel's, some of our recruitment activities, we recently did a career comeback workshop with Talent Corp, where we kind of, you know, talked to a group of people that have probably, you know, stopped working for a few years and was looking for an opportunity to go back, especially during the pandemic time, where some of our roles are 
able to be performed remotely uh, because not many people would love to move entirely their family to Penang where we are located. So there are opportunities about that. And sometimes uh, every quarter, once in a while, we have this talent meetup session. So this is like more of a casual session where you know professionals can come in and understand the company more, uh, connect with people without the pressure of you know attending an interview, right? It's about knowing the company, knowing the people in there, and also allow us, the employees, to employers to get to know more about what you're doing in your respective career. And besides that, well, we have mega virtual career fairs where we have um, also similar webinars that help people to, you know, uh, offer tips, insights into the East industries on how to ace a particular interview and uh, to introduce the different roles that we have in this organization. And uh, definitely, if you are interested, um, uh, just follow us, you know, sign up our talent form and we'll keep you communicated in a lot of our mega events that, that are happening. So these are some of the initiatives that we have been doing uh, to, to, to help, you know, some of the professionals that are unemployed or looking to, uh, for a career change in this current uh, era. Thank you, Shinzi. Nicholas, over to you. Uh, we, we don't have a specific one. I think we're just talking about as from uh, the MDA point of view, but uh, you know, as MDA, we want to look at making sure our local companies are as competitive as possible because we represent quite a lot of companies that are just going to tech. For example, we have a lot of publishers that we represent. Uh, you know, they are uh, media companies, etc., but they don't necessarily have a tech uh, background or you know expertise in, in digital per se. So we want to be able to allow them to be able to be a bit more competitive. Uh, you know, just, I think beyond the salary uh, point of view, uh, you know, a lot of internal things that, you know, everyone needs to offer. But I think uh, from a perspective of, you know, the company that I work for, uh, Rev in the group, we look at, internally, we look at top talent and, and how we can coach them or create a path for them to continue to, you know, sustain or, you know, contribute to the company a lot more rather than the current role. Even though, you know, we're, we can't be competing with, you know, the regional uh, tech company, but we want to be able to keep them uh, within the company and sort of like contribute to a bigger goal within, within the company itself. And that gets everyone motivated uh, as a whole. Thank you. But to you, Anthony. Um, thanks. Um, so I, I wear like two hats, I think. <laughs> so I'll give a, a, each one one perspective. So um, from a Conferry perspective, uh, we support uh, hiring for uh, different levels in organization. And uh, uh, one particular uh, aspect uh, allows us to continuously hire on a long-term basis with clients. Uh, and it is, um, I must tell you that that hiring pace is extremely high. So in order to work with the talent, uh, because the need of the client is also there, so we have to balance that off. So there's a, a lot of uh, uh, programs to attract the talent, uh, develop the talent, and also uh, align the talent with the client, right? So that aspect is uh, uh, something which is very well structured and allows us to build that pathway for that group of people. And it's, uh, it's, it's known as recruitment process outsourcing, right? So that activity allows us to build a sufficient pool. And of course, we work in Penang, for example, we work in Klang Valley, we work, and of course, rest of the world as well. I'm not limiting it because we have capacity to cover 60 countries. Um, and which also means that uh, we are always looking at the pipeline from a demand perspective and studying the supply perspective. And we are trying to balance that need. And for, for purposes today, uh, for digital, we are looking at it very carefully. In fact, that is how the study was done uh, to share with you what's the trending happening around the world and what's happening in, 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 in Malaysia. So to bridge that, we are also looking at the right mindset and the right skill set as part of what we are working with the client and as well as individuals. So this is an ongoing process, and I believe it is going to continue the same pace at which we are right now. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Anthony. Dr. Carroll, what about in uh, SDEC? What are you guys doing to support the mid-career professionals who are unemployed? Yeah, I mean, uh, we don't have any uh, specific ones yet because we're just barely a year old. And given that, we are still have the job opening for a few of the positions uh, available. So, um, but in terms of uh, finding the right talent, we're not just looking at people who has the, the uh, right digital background and everything. We also emphasize on the right mindset, right? Apart from the right uh, skill set as well. So we are welcome. We welcome uh, mid career professionals that wants to transition, but they already have the interest and passion, you know, in, in uh, moving uh, the 
implementation of uh, Sarawak digital economy. So we are open to that. Uh, we're not only just looking to the mid care professional, we also uh, welcome the fresh graduates right, who has the passion and the right uh, mindset you know, and share our working values to join us. Uh, but most importantly, because one, one of our mandate is not just to uh, grow up our own organization, but also those in our ecosystem, right? I mean, that we are helping the private sectors uh, in Sarawak to grow uh, and also to develop uh, so that there will be more players in digital uh, industries. Right? And also we are looking to grow the training provider as well. So those who have uh, joined you know, multiple programs, uh, be it from uh, MDEC or to uh, any other platform, then they can venture into this uh, private training providers uh, space, right? And also uh, we are looking into uh, uh, developing the job creators themselves, where we also have the uh, startup and entrepreneurship programs you know, too, so that we have a lot more uh, job creators uh, compared to job seekers. So there'll be uh, a lot more uh, jobs available in Sarawak. Well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karo. I think that's a really important point to have an ecosystem uh, that is going to start, you know, creating more of these jobs uh, for, you know, for Sarawak as well as East Malaysia. So, you know, with that, I think we've come to the end of the session today. And I just wanted to sum up. I think what we've heard is that, number one, there are opportunities plenty, right? So lots and lots of opportunities. Uh, and one of the things that also came across for me is it's not just the digital tech skills, but the capabilities, the mindset, the attitude, it's a total package that we're looking at. So we're not looking for, I mean, employers are not looking for robots. They're looking for people with a lot of soft skills, people skills, human skills, complemented by digital tech skills, right? There are also opportunities to build experience. If you don't have experience, you know, do some gigs, volunteer jobs, whatever, uh, even follow your passion, but apply the skills that you've learned and demos demonstrate those skills. Uh, and last but not least, I think a lot of the points that were touched on in this panel uh, illustrate the relevance of many of the sessions that are being run over these next two weeks. So please do uh, do follow us, you know, and join us for the other sessions that are covering the, the jobs that were mentioned today that are in demand, uh, you know, how you can upskill yourself through lifelong learning platforms, how you can boost your profile on social media platforms, how you can pick up soft skills, uh, and, and also uh, do check out the Job Expo, which has more than 5,000 jobs from 100 companies. So with that, a huge thanks to all of the panel members uh, today. It's been excellent, it's been great, very, very enlightening, and all the best to the uh, audience who are here with us today. Thank you, and back to you, Hasro. Thank you, Dr. Sumitra, and to our esteemed panel members for the engaging and interesting discussion to kickstart the My Digital Workforce Week related to Malaysian digital jobs opportunities and its future. Thank you, everyone. We will now be moving forward to our next session of the day. It will be beginning very shortly. So do click join session and also complete the survey for each of the sessions for us to continuously survey your better. Also a reminder, okay, like Dr. Smita mentioned just now, we encourage job seekers to visit the hashtag My Digital Workforce job portal open from the 16th to the 30th of August, 2021. See you in the next session in a bit. Thank you.